Good morning, everybody. It is um, a real privilege to be here this morning in the house of the Lord and to, to worship and praise with everybody here this morning. Um, I, I've been here a time or two. It's normally been with the um, community services that we have around holidays and things like that, but this is the first time I've ever been able to be here to actually worship with you on a Sunday, uh, and I'm so excited about that. Thank you. I will tell you, um, this church this, and, and the congregation that make it up have been such a blessing uh, to me personally and to my family uh, over the past eight or nine months or so uh, as we've gone through something that I'll, I'll share a story around here. Uh, and I just appreciate the ministry uh, and just I thank God for the power uh, that he uh, shared and and blessed our family with through the prayers of this church, through its encouragement, through the cards, through the financial support. Uh, it's truly been amazing. Uh, so I, I'm here, uh, excited to be here, but also humbled uh, by uh, the ministry that, that comes uh, through the people of this church. So I'd like to start off with a scripture here today. <clears throat> and what I'd like to start off before I actually get into my story, my testimony is share some scripture and some biblical foundation around light and darkness, uh, both of which uh, are, are, are spelled out in Genesis and all through the Bible. But I'm going to start out with light, and then I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about darkness, and then uh, go into the testimony here. I'm going to start off with Genesis 1-3. <clears throat> and God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. Now, this is the first thing uh, in, in verse 3 that God speaks into existence. He said, let there be light. And then he said, let, uh, he saw that the light was good. And keep in mind, this isn't the sun. It's not the sunshine we're talking about. That was day four that God created the sun and the moon. So he's created this light, this brilliance. Uh, he saw that it was good, and then he separated light uh, and darkness. I'm going to get a little more specific, and I'm going to go to John 8, 12. And this is where Jesus is speaking to the people, and he states, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So in Jesus, light and life really become one and the same. Jesus is light so that we may have life abundant here on earth, and life eternal beyond our experience here on earth. So just to recap the whole light picture that God spells out for us, God said, let there be light. He spoke it into existence. He said that it was good. He separated it from the darkness. And then who is light? Jesus Christ is light. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness that all being said, that if we're seeking Jesus, if we're keeping our pencil sharp, uh, and we're, we're walking in his word, uh, if we're talking with the Lord in prayer, if we're thinking about Jesus and even sharing what we're thinking with Jesus, we're in his light. We're immersed in his light. I want to talk a little bit about darkness then, which is also spelled out very clearly for us in God's word. Ephesians 6.12 says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So what we have here, what's spelled out for us in God's Word, is a real hierarchy. Uh, he, he's very specific and says, you've got rulers, you've got authorities. There's powers, there's spiritual forces. So there's this, this makeup, this hierarchy. And so as we look at this, this definition of light and this definition of darkness, uh, it, it shows us that anything that's spiritual, there's not anything that's gray in there. There's no, well, this is spiritual and it's, it's not it's not really bad, but it's not really of God. There is no gray. God shows us that from a spiritual standpoint, anything in the spiritual realm, it's light, it's of Christ, or it's not. It's of darkness. 
God separated the light from darkness. Uh, and there's a very distinct, a razor thin line between those two. And it makes, makes us think, well, why would anybody ever cross that line? Um, if it's razor thin, why, why would you stick a foot into it or a hand or a shoulder? Uh, why would you straddle that line? N needless to say, immerse yourself in it completely. And it's because of deception. Deception is a powerful tool uh, that Satan uses to get us to, to stick our toes in the darkness and, uh, and maybe a foot and, and get further and further into it. Now, if Satan showed up uh, next to us in the car as we were driving or showed up in our workplace or in the kitchen as we're having a cup of coffee and, and he looked like the artist's uh, depiction of him with the horns and the, the hooved feet and he said to us, hey... Uh, I've got some thoughts that I want you to dwell on. I've got some words that I want you to say today. There's some behaviors that I really want you to express. It'd be pretty easy for us to say, get away from me. Get out of my kitchen, get out of my car, get out of my workplace. But that's not the way it works. The powers of darkness are very subtle. This hierarchy that's described for us in Ephesians is very subtle, seemingly unnoticeable, and that's why they call it deception. I've got a concordance in the back of my Bible here, so I looked at deceive and deception, and I found 65 references in the Bible that warn us or talk to us or share with us about deception, about being prepared for it, about being aware of it, about being careful not to be deceived. And God's talking to us, his people, 65 times. You know, if this is truly God's word, which it is, and God said, I'm going to tell my people 65 times to watch out for deception, I think that's, that's an important one. It's something that I want to be careful about and take note of. So God separated the light from darkness, uh, and it shows us that uh, in Genesis there's a physical aspect around his creation with light and with darkness. There's also very much a spiritual aspect of light and darkness. The physical and the spiritual are connected, and if we look at Genesis and if we look all the way through to Revelation, there's often this connection between the physical and in the spiritual. So it was about a year ago now that um, I started uh, experiencing some pain in my shoulder. And I'd had some problems uh, in my rotator cuff on the other side, on my right side, about a year ahead of that. So I didn't think much of it. I thought, well, here we go again. Uh, I've done something to mess my shoulder up. And so I went to the doctor, and uh, my doctor said, well, you've probably pulled it or sprained it or done something. Uh, the, uh, I'll give you some anti-inflammatories for it, and that should take care of it. And about a month later, September, October, it was still hurting, and I noticed that I'd gotten a knot on the very top of my shoulder, and I thought, well, that's not supposed to be there. I'm not supposed to have knots. So went back to the doctor, and I said, hey, my shoulder's still hurting. Now I've got a, a knot. I think something, I've got some swelling or something. Uh, and they looked at it again and said, well, Let's uh, up the pain relievers a little bit. Let's up the anti-inflammatories, and we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, and then around the end of October, 1st of November, uh, it was uh, hurting even more, um, and the knot was uh, starting to grow. Uh, and so I went back, and uh, my doctor said, well, let's get an x-ray. And so I got the x-ray. Uh, that came back with some what the uh, radiologist called abnormalities to it. This, you should have this looked at a little closer. So it was the Monday before Thanksgiving that um, my doctor said, we're going to set you up with an MRI. And so Monday night, uh, 7 p.m., I go in and get this MRI, uh, which is quite an experience. And uh, so you're in this tube, and it sounds like a, a washing machine that's off balance with a hammer in it uh, for about 40 minutes. Uh, so finally got out of that, and I'm like, whew, I'm glad that's over. And... Uh, I got a call at 8 a.m. the next morning from my doctor's appointment, and uh, this is your doctor's office. Can you come in? And I said, yeah, okay, sure. When? They said, right now. And I thought, 
well, this can't be good. <laughs> when a doctor calls you and says, get in right here right now, uh, you know, 12 hours after a, uh, an MRI, um, you know the news isn't going to be great. But even knowing that I just had an MRI, knowing that the doctor's saying you need to come in and talk to me, nothing really prepares you uh, for sitting there with your doctor uh, and have them look at you and say, this isn't good. Um, this, this is cancer, uh, and it's everywhere. And so we're going to set up a whole series of tests for you over the next week or two. We're going to have you go through a CAT scan and a uh, PET scan, and that may lead to a biopsy and hundreds of blood tests uh, in, in the upcoming months. Uh, but we're going to find out what this is. And when a doctor says, now don't, you know, you're, you, you probably have many more years ahead of you, you know, that type of thing, and, and they're consoling you, again, it, it doesn't give you this uh, feeling of uh, high expectations. And so I drove home that day, um, and I was in a fog for the most part. Uh, went home, talked to my wife about it. Uh, that afternoon, it just seemed very surreal. I just, you know, as, as strong as you want your faith to be, uh, news like this and really coming to terms with it puts you in this state of, of fogginess. It was like I was uh, walking around in a dream that, that day. Well, that was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and there was a service at the Wadesville Baptist Church uh, for a, a community service, and Stephen and I and, and uh, several others were going to play that night. So I'm, going to, I'm still going to do this. Uh, that'll be a, a good place. There's no better place to be than in God's house. Uh, and my guitar was at the ch my church in, in Poseyville. And so I thought, well, I need to, I'll just stop by on the way, grab my guitar, uh, and then head down to Wadesville for, for this service. So I, I got to the church about 5.30, and I noticed the lights were on. I thought, well, this is odd. And so I walk in, and I walk into the sanctuary. My guitar is sitting about where Stevens is, um, and there's, the lights are on but dim, there's a lot of people, there's a line down the aisle, and there's a mumbling and a low talking. I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? And then I see that there's a casket uh, at the front of the church, and I'd walked into a visitation. And after being in a fog all day and being hit with all these things that, all these thoughts and all these ideas uh, all these what ifs that you get that just topped off the surrealness. It was it was truly like a dream. And I thought, am I getting a foreshadowing here of of what's to come or or what's happening? And about that time, I was in the back. My pastor walked up to me and said, "Hey, how you doing?" I said, "Oh, good, good. Um, I, I need to get my guitar for the community service tonight, but I don't want to come up through here and around the people." And he said, "Well, come with me. There's a door in our." Uh, sanctuary off to the side. He said, I'll go with you. And we walked around back, came in the side, uh, and there's an office about where this one is, and that's where my guitar case was. And so I took my guitar, we went in there, I started um, putting it in the case and had it on my shoulder, and I said, thanks so much, I'm going to head towards Wadesville. And I was walking out the door, we were about midway through the, uh, across the sanctuary here, uh, up on the, uh, the front, and he said, hey, I, I know you had an MRI last night. How'd that go? And I just stopped, and I looked at him. And I think he picked up on my face that, OK, this isn't good. He goes, let's go back. And, and we went back into his office. And he, we talked for a while. Uh, and he certainly offered me some encouragement. And I said, I, I, today I keep going to the story in Mark 5. Um, in Mark 5, there's a lady. Um, there's a lady who's had suffering from bleeding for a long period of time. Uh, and as she finds out that Jesus is going to be um, coming through her area, what she says was, if I can touch his clothes, I will be healed. And what strikes me in this story is this lady doesn't say, I've tried everything else. Maybe this will work. Uh, she doesn't say, I, I don't know, I'll, I'll give this a shot. What she says, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Th there's a declaration of faith there. Th there's an unwavering, undeniable, I know this will happen, uh, sense of faith to her. 
And you, you know the story. Jesus is walking through what's called a crowd. There's people all around him. If you've ever left a sporting event when the game's over, or if you've been to a concert and the concert's over, and you're in the sea of humanity, that's kind of the, the situation Jesus was in. He's walking through this crowd, and all of a sudden, he, someone touched my clothes. And his disciples said, <laughs> what do you mean? Everyone's touched your clothes. You, you know, you're, you're crowd. He goes, no, someone specifically touched me. I felt the healing uh, come out of me. And he turned around and he said, who touched my clothes? And the, the, the lady knew that, okay, I've, I've been caught. Uh, and she was very humble, and, and, and she went down humbly and said, explained the situation to him. And he said, daughter, it's not my clothes that healed you. It's your faith. I will be healed, was her mindset, through Christ. And Jesus said, you will be healed. And I said to my pastor, this, this is what's been on my mind today. And he said, you need to hang on to that. He said, uh, that, that um, is the faith uh, that will be needed in order to get through this. About two days later, it was Friday, it was the Friday after Thanksgiving, and my sister showed up at my house, and uh, she said, what's going on? I hadn't told anybody. I was wanting to tell my mom first. My mom's got a thing about not wanting to be the last person to find out things, which just seems to be the way it works. Uh, so I was being careful here. I'm going to talk to my mom first and let her know. But my sister sensed something, and she stopped by on Friday and said, what's going on? And I explained the situation to her. She had a book in her hand, and it was based on Psalm 91. And Psalm 91 is such an incredible uh, promise uh, uh, of God's faithfulness, of what he'll do. Um, it talks about delivering you from the fowler's snare, the, the powers of darkness itself, and from deadly pestilence, which is disease. It talks about God hearing his people, acknowledging his people, and delivering them through their times of trial. And I, I pretty much devoured that uh, book. I also came to James 5, um, and in James 5, uh, it says that if anyone is sick, he should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will make that sick person well. I talked to my pastor on Saturday about this scripture, and I said, this doesn't sound like a suggestion. Uh, and he said, no, 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 it's very much um, a command of God. It's, it's an expectation. You, you shouldn't be shy. You shouldn't be timid about asking others to pray for you um, in times of illness. Uh, and so um, the elders of our church, we got together uh, and, and they prayed for me. And then all sorts of prayer warriors, um, including the Wadesville Christian Church, uh, family members, people from work. Um, I, I started receiving cards, uh, texts, emails, um, from all over. It says in Hebrews that we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, and I truly experienced that. And it just started this journey for me that um, I call being wonderfully rattled. Uh, it, it was um, rattling, but at the same time, amazing. And I will say that the power of prayer, the encouragement, the support um, that, that this congregation was all a part of certainly had an incredible impact on that journey that led uh, eventually to healing completely. God started showing up for me um, in, in ways that I hadn't experienced before. Um, and it was often at night. I'd go to bed and be, be praying or I'd be reading before I'd turn the light off and, and God would start speaking to me. Uh, the first time that it was notable, it, it wasn't an audible voice, but I, I heard it. Um, and I was saying a prayer. I was getting a PET scan the next day. Uh, I said, well, you know, God, that, that thing's going to look inside of me. And, you know, I just I pray for good results and so on and so forth. And as I'm about to turn the light off, I, yeah, God said, be specific. And I was like, okay. Uh, and so I prayed more, and I was very specific. I started naming the, the organs that I know uh, and my bone marrow, and I prayed for protection. I prayed that Jesus' blood would, would be through all that. I prayed for a prevention from um, anything that would cause them to say the word terminal.
I also, uh, as I mentioned, was reading Psalm 91.3, and Psalm 91.3 says that I will deliver you, and some version says I will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. The deadly pestilence converts to deadly disease, um, and so I had clung to that. I was praying that often and thanking God for His saving me from deadly pestilence. Uh, and this was another time that, again, it wasn't something uh, audible, but uh, I, I heard it n- n- nonetheless. And he said, why are you only reading the second part of the sentence? Read the whole sentence. And the whole sentence is, I will deliver you from the deadly pest, I will deliver you from the fowler's snare, darkness, and from deadly pestilence, the disease. Those two go together. And as I started to pray about that and think about that, it's true. Um, you know, if, if you continue to read that scripture in James 5 that says, have the elders pray over you, it, it goes on to say, uh, confess your sins as you are anointed. And as these people are praying over you, confess your sins so that you may be healed. So there's a physical and a spiritual that bind together. Matthew 9 verses uh, verse 12, uh, get someone who's crippled here. And Jesus said, um, looks at him, and his first words are, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees were offended at that. They're like, wait a minute, who are you to forgive that person's sins? And Jesus just said, well, what would you rather me say? Take up your mat and walk? Oh, by the way, take up your mat and walk. And he did. Uh, and then Uh, John 5, another person suffering from being crippled. Jesus said, what do you want? And Jesus said, I want to be, or the person said, I want to be healed. And Jesus heals them. And then he said, now you're healed. Stop your sinning or something worse could happen. And so God was revealing this. Hey, there's a physical and a spiritual. There's a connection here. Uh, I want to work on the whole thing. And God would work on me at night after night. And there was times where God would... um, you know, open my eyes to something, and it was as if he was pulling a dirty, nasty, stinky sock out of the bottom of the hamper that had been there way too long, and he'd say, what about this? And I'd say, yeah, I, I don't need that. And he's, okay. And then he'd pull something else up, and he'd say, what about this? And I'd say, well, what about that? Is this glorifying me? Is this benefiting you? Not really. And so things that I'd really never thought about, uh, things that had to do with you know, the, the health of my marriage, uh, the health of my, my heart, uh, you know, being his workmanship, being holy because he is holy. Um, there was just this eye-opening revelation of, of things night after night. Uh, and he led me to Hebrews 12, which says God works on us. Uh, as, as people that he loves, there are times where he chastens us, where he prunes us. He starts to cut off things that may be unnecessary so that we can share in his work, so that we can share in his holiness and what it says, produce a harvest of peace and of righteousness after being trained in it. God was shining his light on things, a very bright light, and saying, I I want you to to be cleaned. I want you to be pruned. I want you to be my workmanship. Let's work on this together. I believe all this was happening at a time where that that surrounding, um, in in, uh, Hebrews it says, the cloud of witnesses were praying. Um, I think those prayers were truly being answered. And God was working on me physically, uh, and he was working on me spiritually as well. 1 John 1.7 says, If we walk in the light as he in the light, we'll have fellowship with him. And as we walk with one another, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us. So again, three things here. Being in his light, having fellowship with him, and being purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our goal is to always be in the light. This is a continuous process. It's not sort of a once and done thing with Jesus Christ. There's a continuous process for us as purification. And an example of that is when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. 
And Peter said, oh, you, I don't want you to wash my feet, Lord. And he goes, well, if I don't wash your feet, I don't, you don't have any part of me. And Peter's like, well, wash me all then. Wash my whole body. And he goes, you don't need your whole body washed. You need your feet washed. We all step in it from time to time. There's that darkness that we get tripped up in. And he just, Jesus says, I want to wash your feet. And he cleanses us and he purifies us. And again, that, that's a, an ongoing process. Why would we ever leave that? Why would we ever leave that light? It goes again back to deception. God, God showed me um, some things where darkness was so subtle, uh, and he also showed me that healing is both a physical process and healing is a spiritual process. And through the prayers of many, his power worked in me uh, for that. Um, this is a, a PET scan of mine in April. And this is when the doctor said, I, I've sliced this every way I can, uh, top ways, bottom ways. I've turned it around. She could see this, this image three-dimensionally. She goes, there's no cancer here. Um, the, the darkness uh, in my heart and kidneys and bladder are where the solution for the PET scan collects. So she said, that's nothing. And she said, you don't have much of a brain, so that's why that's dark there. So, but uh, otherwise, you're cancer-free. This is four months after my diagnosis. Uh, she said, let me show you your PET scan from December. I'd never seen that. This is your PET scan from December. She said, everything that's black is where cancer had invaded your body. And this is where I about fell out of my chair because that was gone. In four months' time, that was gone. I, I had been healed. And so I just want to glorify God in that today. I want to glorify that God offers us both physical healing, that he offers us spiritual healing. Uh, and it's the ministry of individuals. It's the ministry of, of, of the church. It's the ministry of churches uh, to really tap into that power when people need it. And that's what I experienced. I needed it, and people provided their prayers, and God provided me so much healing from a spiritual and from a uh, physical standpoint. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this day. I thank you for life. I thank you, dear Lord God, for your love, for your grace, for your mercy, for your sovereignty. I thank you, Lord God, for the abundance and the bounty that you pour down. I pray for every person who's recently gotten a diagnosis uh, that may be scary, uh, it may be tough. And I pray to Lord God that their faith might be strengthened just uh, as the lady uh, who was healed by touching your garment. Pray to Lord God that that kind of faith, that kind of conviction can be in their hearts and in their mind and help us all, Lord, to glorify you so that they can be encouraged and so that they can be healed. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.